Christ is the exact likeness of the unseen God. He existed before God made anything at all. And in fact, Christ himself is the creator who made everything in heaven and earth. The things we can see and the things we can't. The spirit world with its kings and kingdoms, its rulers and authorities, all were made by Christ for his own use and his own glory. He was, made, he was before all else and before all else began, and it is his power that holds everything together. He is the head of the body made up of his people, that is the church which he began. And he is the leader of all who arise from the dead, so that he is the first in everything. For God wanted all of himself to be in his son. It was through his son and through what his son did that God cleared a path for everything to come to him. All things in heaven and on earth and for Christ's death on the cross has made peace with God for all by his blood. The song says that what he's done is indescribable. We can't really describe anything and everything that he's done, but we're going to try as we sing together and give him the glory. So would you stand together, please, as we lift our voices, singing about what he's done through creation and in through the cross. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea. So Paul continues to describe our condition as he talks about what Jesus Christ has done. He said, you were dead in sins and your sinful desires were not yet cut away. Then you gave you, then he gave you a share in the very life of Christ for he forgave all your sins and blotted out the charges proved against you, the list of his commandments, which you had not yet obeyed. 
He took this list of sins and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. In this way, God took away Satan's power to accuse you of sin, and God openly displayed to the whole world Christ's triumph at the cross, where your sins were all taken away. And we're amazed that he would do that for us. celebrate because Jesus Christ died for us, but he died for people around the world, and we just concluded our missions conference, our missions festival, as you see with the posters yet around, and the flags, the theme was be present, as we desire to be present around the world to communicate the good news of Jesus, and in your bulletin there is a faith promise information card, as we encourage people to get involved in giving to the Great Commission Fund to give to missions. You may have already had one and filled it out and prepared about what you would like to give to help support people who go around the world to tell people about Jesus. Again, the card tells a little bit about why we do it, what we do. And there's two portions, one that you can fill out the amount that you want to give and that will be collected so that we just have a total of what we, of those who have submit cards. Some don't submit cards and give anyway, and that's great. Uh, but we just have, gives us a little bit of an idea how much we give. Again, it's the idea of what we believe that God has for us that we can put in our budget or that we could sacrifice by giving up something or that God could bring in. We ask by faith that he'll bring in something above and beyond our, what normally comes in. Like somebody sends some money through the mail or something happens, we could 
give that to the Great Commission Fund. So it's a, it explains it about faith promise. We'll collect those, and we'll, then, uh, we'll announce, maybe not today, but next week, what our total is, and encourage everybody to be involved, even if you don't fill out a faith promise card. But we enjoy giving to missions. We enjoy reaching out around the world, and one of the ways we do that is through Operation Christmas Child. There's, again, a brochure in the, the bulletin that talks about Operation Christmas Child, how you can pack a, a gift-filled shoebox. We have uh, shoeboxes on the table in the foyer that you can pick up and use, and there's more information. Uh, you can ask Jennifer. She's here. Just, uh, and you need to ask more information or me. We can contact you get the right place for information about why we give what, uh, what we want to see happen. Well, today we have a video from Fiji. You know, sometimes at this point in our calendar, it's already cold, and we're thinking, oh, it'd be nice to go someplace. Well, it's pretty nice out today, but still Fiji would be a great place to go. But it's a tremendous story of what, how, how God worked in this young man's life and then what he is doing because he came to know Jesus. There are people around the globe that are not exposed to the gospel. And that shoebox, I was a Christian before, but I know how impactful that was. I am one of millions around the globe that received the shoebox. My name is Sakusa Rokovasa Vakandewa Tambua, Jr. I go uh, by Zach, and I'm originally from the Fiji Islands. My childhood was different from what a typical kid would go through. There were no toys, uh, no video games. We'll play with sticks and uh, jack stones. Playing rugby, of course, there was no rugby ball. We'd use a Coca-Cola bottle. Sometimes it hit you in the face, and, but we'll just carry on. The day when I received my shoe box, my mom was volunteering to distribute the shoe boxes. She made me the last kid to receive a shoe box. So she said, you know, if we run out, sorry. <laughs> but thank God, I got my shoe box. I opened it. I don't know how to say it. I, I, there was no word for me to say because I, I don't have this. Uh, I don't have these toys. I don't have these school supplies that was coming out from the boxes. And in this shoe box was a yellow yo-yo jaw-dropping moment of course no more playing with rocks and sticks I have a yo-yo and those cars and one of the scripture that came to my mind is while we were yet sinners Christ died for us we were all undeserving of the grace of God but someone was full of grace spend their resources their money their time somebody thought of me God opened doors to my life and to my family. I moved to the United States. I'm called into children's ministry. I took our church van, went down to a store and buy shoe boxes. We packed 117 shoe boxes for my youth group and our church. I may not be face to face with someone around the globe, but with that shoe box, I'm evangelizing, multiplying, discipling someone to come to know Christ. Being part of the discipleship journey is very humbling. The Raiders Journey Discipleship Program is a program that Operation Christmas Child includes for those that want to know more about Christ. This is where my heart is, evangelism, discipleship, and multiplication. You have a couple of weeks, three weeks, in fact, to pick up a box and fill it up. We already have five boxes that have been returned, so that's a good start. Encourage again to be involved, and if you can, just can't pray for it in this tremendous ministry. As we hear stories, people around the world come to know Jesus because of this. Um, small group Bible study begins on this Thursday, meeting at church. Encourage you to come as we get started and talk about what we want to do then as the study. So this will be the opening week. There are also voter guides out on the information center by reputable Christian organizations. So you can pick them up and use them. Ushers, would you come please so we can worship by giving of our offerings? Let's bow together please to pray. <clears throat> 
Lord, we're grateful that we can gather because of Jesus Christ, because of what he has done for us, because he has come to give us life, because he gave his life. He's come to give us eternal life, give us forgiveness of sins, that we, because we've placed our trust in him and what he has done, and that we're turned away from our trusting in our own goodness and in our own possibility of trying to save ourselves, that we said it's only because of what Jesus has done that we could ever enter a right relationship. So we're grateful for him coming to earth, dying on the cross, and rising from the dead so that we could have that right relationship. Thank you that we can share that good news with people around the world as we heard about Cambodia and what Joyce John shared and about the needs there, about how you would continue to work in that place as she is heading back the end of December and getting back into teaching at the nursing school and desiring to have Bible studies to be able to talk about Jesus. May there be students who are ready and willing to engage with her and to want to hear about what she has to say, about what really you have to say about how they can have a life. Thank you for Operation Christmas Child that we can share together in this way and that we can communicate the good news of Jesus with children and families around the world. We take some time to pray for some needs. We pray for Herb Bingham, who will be having a procedure tomorrow known as the Watchman procedure where they're going to be implanting a device in his heart to prevent blood clots from leaving. That procedure would go well and smoothly. Thank you that you are the healer and you give the doctors wisdom. Pray that you would be with them and everything would go well so that it could, as anticipated, already go home tomorrow uh, after the surgery. So just watch over him, God, we pray. Uh, For Debbie Campbell, who's been sick the past few weeks and still sick today, with various things that you continue to bring her health and healing. And for others in the congregation who have physical needs, we pray for them as well. We pray for people around us who need to know Jesus as Savior, that you would help us to be open to the needs and open to sharing, and that we'd be clear in what we have to share. And we thank you, God, again for this opportunity to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our missions festival was all about taking the Great Commission, the good news to people around the world. Operation Christmas Child is another opportunity for us to do that, to remember what we are are to be about, and then we are called about what we need to do here locally. There's a song you may have heard on the radio uh, by a group called Cain, a brother and two sisters, called The Commission, which weaves in the words of Jesus' last words while he was on earth, with uh, beautiful music and scenery of them singing, but also then some pictures from the, the series The Chosen, which is a portrayal of Christ's life. So it's 
very appropriate for us to, to hear again this challenge for us to take the good news of Jesus around the world. We want to then shout to the Lord and express our appreciation. We want to shout about the Lord, meaning we want to proclaim that good news to people. As you see, the pictures of what it may have been like for Jesus to interact with the woman at the well, with Nicodemus, with the kids, with the person who was demon-possessed and the changes he brought. And think about, wow, if we would have been there, that's him interacting with us. But he interacted with us while we're here on earth. And we said, that's what he did. He changed us and the change he can bring to other people. So let's stand together to sit and sing about what we have, what we possess, but we're also what we can share. video said that this isn't the end of the story with Jesus leaving planet earth. There is more to come. As he told us, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be there also with me. This is the new song that we sent out and you heard it again on the radio, Hymn of Heaven, about our desire to be with Jesus Christ forever in heaven.
Please be seated. Are we lovers or are we haters? Are we sometimes a lover and then sometimes that we go to the opposite? We're a hater? Well, today's scripture lays out some practical insights as it goes through talking about love, hate, love, hate, love. So they're intertwined. We're going to get deal with hate to begin with to kind of get it out of the way. We're in 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 24. So we'll read the totality so you can just hear what's going on in the passage, and then we'll come back and dig through it. So 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 11. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brother, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. So again, we're beginning with hate. Scripture says it's not good to be a hater, as it begins in verse 12. The example, we we'll go back to the first person born on the planet, Cain, the son of Adam and Eve. First child well, he, along with his brother who came later, Abel, were the best kids on the block. Well, of course, there was only kids on the block, so they had to be the best kids on the block at this point. But one day, they went before the Lord to offer their sacrifices. We're told in, back in Genesis that Cain brought something, some fruit from the land. He was a farmer, he raised crops, and he brought just some stuff in the Insinuation is he just brought some stuff that he kind of scraped together. Whereas Abel brought some of the best portion of the flock, some of the best part of things to sacrifice to God. And the Lord accepted Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. Now, it may be that God had told them that they were supposed to bring an animal sacrifice, and Cain refused to do that. And so that definitely would be something that would be wrong. But then there, there, at least it's, it says that Cain didn't act in faith, but more out of routine and formality, and had the wrong attitude and motivation. Cain became angry because his sacrifice was not accepted. And the Lord reminded him that if he did what was right, he'd be accepted. But he also warned him to be very cautious because he said that sin was at the door and was seeking to take control of him. Well, a few days later, Cain and Abel were out in the field, and Cain seized the opportunity and allowed sin to control him, and he killed his brother while they're out in the field. And the scripture tells us that he did it because he belonged to the devil and wasn't righteous, and he walked in the footsteps of the devil who was the, the first murderer. The warning for us is to not be like Cain. And some think it's easy because I haven't murdered anybody. I don't plan on ever murdering anybody. I'm good. I am not like Cain. But there's more. Verse 15 tells us that the person who hates his brother is a murderer. It seems awfully strong to us. Because if you were to ask everyone their opinion would, here, would you rather be hated or murdered? 
I think we'd all say we'd, all, we'd rather be hated than murdered. Okay? We could stand with that. We could live with it. Because with murder, we, we wouldn't live. Which says again that hatred and murder, same. Because the mur- hatred leads the intent and the attitude toward others. It's just the same. Jesus said the same thing in the Sermon on the Mount. And murder begins with hatred. Author Ray Steadman, I found him to be very helpful in this particular passage. And he pondered if Cain asked himself about why he murdered his brother. He said, I'm sure if he did that undoubtedly the answer he gave would have been very much like the answers we give to justify our attitudes of hate and dislike of other people. Probably he would have answered on the emotional level. Something like, well, he was so pious. He was smug. He was always showing me up, and I just couldn't stand it anymore. That is the kind of excuse we often give, is it not, of our attitude toward another. Or perhaps he would have resorted to some threat to me. He was a, to my reputation. The world was simply not big enough for both of us. It was either him or me, so I got rid of him. Cain was angry with God. He refused to accept God's evaluation. God's judgment of what was right and wrong. He was angry at God's ordering of life. He was angry because God would not play according to his rules. In other words, he wanted to be God himself and was angry when God refused to let him exercise the sovereignty which only God can have. In his mind, twisted now by the devil, all of this seemed to focus upon his innocent brother. All of his anger at the invisible power of God, the invisible person of God, became focused on a visible object, his brother. So in blind delusion, he struck him down. That is a revelation of the nature of hate. It's directed at a human object, but it is always an attack upon God. It's a rejection of the rule of God. Hate is a deeper force than we usually think it to be. It is more than a mere psychological reaction of one human being to another. It releases sinister powers into the human stream. It brings dark powers into control of human minds and human hearts. It twists and distorts, deludes and blocks. What we do, therefore, is always folly, foolish, senseless, without any reason behind it. When it's put that way, hate doesn't sound very good, does it? Because people can just throw it, oh, I hate something. Think about what hate really is. Hatred seeks and actively works for the things that will harm another person. And the use of the word hates is to be understood as keeps on hating. It describes a person who is mastered by hate. The idea of wishing the person who's hated would really perish. Having a person on the hate list is the same as having the person on a hit list. We don't talk about that. That's something that the mob would do. They have their hit lists. Hating somebody, that's like saying, yeah, we wish they were gone. More from Stedman on the world's solution for hatred. said, all he, or the person who is ruled by the world, does is to attempt by education to limit the manifestation of hatred, or by moral restraint to keep it suppressed and bottled up inside. Of course, all he succeeds in doing is merely to change the name on the door. Hate becomes at best indifference or avoidance of another person. Best, an unregenerate person can do in handling this force in his life, if he hates anybody, is to come to the place where he finally says, well, I won't have anything to do with him. Let him go his way and I'll go mine. At worst, hatred becomes disguised under other words, contempt, disdain, prejudice, and other evil names. When we think about hate, it, verse 13 shouldn't come as a surprise to us because it tells us that the world hates us. Jesus gave the initial warning again in his sermon message just before he left the planet the night before he died. He said, the world is going to be antagonistic to you who are my followers. We should expect to be on the receiving end of hatred as we hold out the truth about Jesus Christ being the one and only way of salvation, the only way to heaven. And as we desire to live according to God's standards rather than the world's standards. So our behavior is going to be different. Our attitudes are going to be different. Our priorities are going to be different. And it puts us squarely in opposition to the world's views and their ways of doing things. 
with the assurance that we can take it, it's okay to be hated by the world. Or where it's not good to be a hater like the world. The outlook for haters comes in verses 14 and 15. It's extremely bleak. Verse 15 tells us no murderer has eternal life in him. The previous verse for 14 is phrased a little differently. Anyone who does not love, which is hate, remains in death. So the person whose life is marked by a pattern of selfishness, envy, jealousy, strife, hatred, gives indication he remains in spiritual death. A couple of ways to understand this, because First John is written to people who know Jesus Christ as Savior. One, the most devastating could be that the person never really has come to that place of putting their trust in Jesus Christ to begin with. They're revealing their true identity that they've never come born again. They've never experienced eternal life. Also, be by the key word remains is that the person would be living, going back to living by the old nature. He's remaining in that part. They still haven't gotten rid of that part of the old nature as we are continually to grow like Jesus Christ. But they're remaining, they're biting in that, they're temporarily making their home in the, the world and living like the world. It's true that's the same thing that happens when we sin. We're temporarily abiding in the world. Whatever the sin might be, whether it might be lust or th- th- stealing something or you know, whatever it might be, we're living in the world remaining that way. But we aren't to do that. We're to move away from that. We are to allow the eternal life we have through Jesus Christ to be in control. So let's get to the better topic, the topic of love. Go back again to verse 11 where it talks about the importance of love. It says this is a message we've heard from the beginning. It's one of the first things that's proclaimed about God loves the world. God loves you. He desires for you to come to be with him in heaven. It's the beginning of a person's Christian experience. It's what draws people to God because God loves you. We want to be loved by God the Father. John's used this kind of language previously where he's written that it's about the new command about loving that we've heard from the beginning. So he's saying again at this point, almost halfway through the book, he said it's not a new teaching, not something that should catch us off guard, like, wow, I've never heard that before. I'm supposed to love others? Really? It's just like a total surprise and shock to me. Especially for those people who are fellow Christians, I'm to love them? Who'd have thought? He said, no, it's not something new. You've heard it. You understood it. But yet the, the command to love one another, this is listed five times from this point on. He says, love one another, love one another. He keeps saying it again and again. Jesus commanded us to, to love one another. So John is just picking up what Jesus has said. And the importance of love is shown through the supreme expression of love in verse 16. As you look at it, do you notice how similar it is to... John 3.16. You can make a great study of just going through some passages in Scripture, some of the 3.16 verses, and you'll find some tremendous truths. Well, John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16 are very much alike. That talks about Jesus' love. And Jesus proclaimed himself as the good shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep. Christ's love was to the nth degree, to the extreme. He gave his life. What more could he give? Nothing. It was absolute, the totality of his love. His death on the cross was the total demonstration of love. So the conclusion we can draw about love, the primacy of love, about how we're to love, we could portray it like this. Christmas is coming up soon, and a lot of us like to listen to Christmas music. And I'm going to even ask, and I'll mention it now, that if you have favorite Christmas songs, that you want me to send out on some of the daily emails throughout Christmas, and then we can tag it, and we can send those out for people. It would be great. We'll do that during Christmas time. So if you have a favorite one, and there's a special way that somebody sings it, let me know. But you might be, for instance, you might be liking to hear the Vienna Boys Choir sing. And there's their, their, their unique style, a cappella, and the lilting style of singing, like, oh, come all you faithful. It's beautiful to listen to. Well, that, we could say, okay, that's the idea of love. 
what what they're communicating here, love one another, is more like having O Come All You Faithful played by the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, where it gets pulsing and deep down it gets into your being. It said this is, you know, just moves every fiber of who you are. So that's what it is. It's supposed to penetrate to the core and just let it just let it flow out and just okay, love one another. It's not just okay, I'm going to love. What okay, the idea love one another. We're to follow the Christ, who is L O V all capitalized. And his high standard is that we ought to lay down our lives for others. Jesus even said this, greater love has no one this than he laid down his life for his friends or his brothers. It's expected we should be willing to give our lives for another. And in some places around the world, that's indeed what happens. In the experience of the United States, probably not what's going to happen. And most Christians, that's probably not what's called for. The normal is expressed in verses 17 and 18. Short of dying in the place of another, we're called upon to meet the needs of other people. Situation is somebody sees a brother in need and has been able to observe and determine the need is real and has the capacity to meet that need, whatever it might be, for food, clothing, or shelter. And there's two options when he sees a need. It can either be compassion or indifference. And this person chooses not to take pity on the person who has needs. James wrote about it in his book. He said, suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed. But do nothing about his physical needs. What good is it? John puts the question this way. How can the love of God be in the person? who sees the need and does nothing about it. Person is still a Christ follower, but really isn't acting like it. So how is God's love there at this point in time? It's not. Action is to do something about the need is required. It's insufficient to claim we love someone merely because we don't want to do wrong toward them. We haven't killed them. We aren't harboring anger toward them. So therefore we love them. Well, it's true love seeks to not hurt somebody. Love is more than that. Love does what is good towards others. It seeks good and actively works for it. Love is more than just words or speeches. Be relatively easy for us to say we're willing to give our lives, knowing the likelihood of it happening is slim and none. For us to say, I will follow Jesus to the death. Let Satan throw all of his weapons and demons at me. Let friends and family mock me. I will lay down my life for others. Don't ask me to love my brothers. Don't ask me to be kind to that person over there. Don't ask me to serve. Don't ask me to do these things. What is often considered to be a small act of love and self-giving, one that's unseen or unnoticed by the crowds, is often more an indication of true love than the huge sacrificial act. Go to 1 Corinthians 13, where it talks about that as well. The story of a Jewish man named Ar... (coughs) Excuse me, woman. (coughs) Art was raised as an atheist. And early in his life, he became a Marxist. So he was during the close World War II, and he served with the American army. And he was in Germany, and he saw the concentration camps and the gas houses and all the inhumanity that had been wreaked by the Nazis. It filled him with hatred, first towards the Nazis, but then towards all humanity, because it's the whole human race was involved. So he went back to Berkeley, the University of California, and studied and studied and threw himself into education, became a professor, but he saw that education wasn't really the answer for changing hearts. He resigned his position. story is his wife lost her mind and was put in a mental institution, so he didn't have a job, wasn't tied down. She decided he'd wander the world. He wound up in Greece. On a rainy day, he was just hitchhiking, wandering around the Greek countryside. Nobody pick him up. 
because he looked terrible, shabby, dirty, just like, who'd want that kind of person in their car? Finally, a brand new caddy, the Cadillac, pulled up alongside the road, and the driver didn't just motion for, the guy, for Art to come in, but he got out, grabbed his backpack, threw it in the back seat on the clean upholstery, and welcomed into his car. He took Art to a hotel, paid for the room, got him some food, and they were eating together. Finally, the man asked Art what he was doing and where he was going. He said all of Art's pent-up heartache, misery, and resentment of life came pouring out of this young Jewish atheist. The man just sat and listened. And when Art was through, the man asked him, you know what the world needs? Those who are willing to wash one another's feet. And Art said, I've never heard anything so beautiful. Why do you say that? The man said, because that's what my Lord did. And then Art listened as the man gave a clear presentation of the gospel. And Art became a Christian and went on to devote his life to serve Christ. All because of one act of love. That's where it started. We're called upon to be like Christ in the manner in which we love and to whom we express love. Jesus loved the world, we're to love the world. Someone has said it's easier to be enthusiastic about humanity with a capital H than it is to love individual men and women, especially those who are uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, or otherwise unattractive. Loving everybody in general may be an excuse for loving nobody in particular. Love is to be a way of life. The laying down of our lives, it's put in a constant, repeated action. It's not one and done, but we're to keep stepping away from our own self-centeredness and stepping towards other-centeredness, to live for others and voluntarily surrender ourselves to meet the needs of others. <clears throat> this again is talking about the relational test that love provides evidence of being in a right relationship with Jesus. It shows that we have passed from death to life, that we belong to the truth. <clears throat> we can be confident of our relationship with God. There are times it tells us in the passage towards the bottom of the last verses we read in 21 and 22, or 19 and 20, when our hearts and consciences go into overdrive, they become more act, overactive, more strict. They might not lose, let loose of some forgiven sin or they dwell on the past. Our hearts condemn us and we're not in a bad spot. It says sometimes we need to put our hearts at rest. And the original words mean either to persuade or tranquilize. The idea of persuading is presenting analytical, logical evidence. Say, okay, heart, I'm going to present you with the logic and explanations for why you should settle down and just take it easy. Tranquilizing cuts to the chase. Basically, it says, heart, take a chill pill and cut it out. You know, either way, just stop going on and condemning because we, what love is, what love is showing, what's doing. The author of Essentials of Discipleship puts it this way. God knows all about our propensity to sin, our constant covering up, our failure to deal the death blow to sinful habits that cripple us. I don't believe God wants us to spend our life in constant morbid introspection. We are sinners and confession restores our fellowship, but we must forgive ourselves as well accept, as accept God's forgiveness. Obedience to God's commands, as it talks about in the idea of love, helps us to understand who we are and what we've done. Obedience is talking about believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as our, that he is our Savior and that we are to love one another. It's echoing of the two great commandments that we are to follow, to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love others as ourselves. Obedience provides the opportunity for us to know that Jesus Christ is living inside of us because we're controlled by his Spirit. Verse 24, it may seem that John is referring to a subjective sense of somehow feeling the Spirit's presence. Well, John Stott argues this isn't the case, but the Spirit's presence is in our lives manifested by objectively through our life and conduct. 
He said, so if we would assure our hearts when they accuse and condemn us, we must look for evidence of the Spirit's working, and particularly whether he is enabling us to believe in Christ, to obey God's commands, and to love the brethren. For the condition of abiding in this is this comprehensive obedience, and the evidence is abiding is the gift of the Spirit. He's there because we love and we're obedient, we're following. It produces the fruits of the Spirit, it enlightens the mind, it sustains us, and helps us to understand. And we see these things and say, okay, that's evidence that God is there. And because we are loving and obeying, that's what we're desiring to do. Again, we're not perfect. We're never going to be completely perfect, but that's the trajectory of our lives. We want to love and express that and be obedient. Loving people shows that we're living in according to God's plan for us. Love provides assurance and comfort and it aids our prayers. It shows that we have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, we can see people in the world who do acts of love. We think they're loving. Love isn't the only indicator, but where it starts from, what's the love based upon? And what, what the world would say they just love because they, there's some cosmic thing known as love up there someplace. We trace it back to what Jesus Christ has done, is that he loved us first and therefore we love him, as we'll find out more in next week's passage. It talks about the greatness of Christ's love for us. So the question is, what are we going to do? Will we love? Will we hate? What are we going to do? How are we going to root out the hate when it temporarily creeps up? Are we going to just let it dwell in us for a while? Or are we going to just boot it to the curb and say, we don't want to do that? How will we do when we are we feel self-condemned by what's going on? How are we going to treat that and say, well, are we our confidence is rooted in what Jesus Christ has done? And based upon what the Bible says and our confidence in that that's truth. So what are we going to do? Who are we going to love? When are we going to love? It says, love one another. That's a challenge for us to get out there and be like Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us again to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. And that because of that, we desire to be like him and to live like him. It's because of an expression of thanks for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand together, please, as we close by singing together a song that reminds us of the extent of Christ's love for us, that he died for us at a place called Calvary. <clears throat>
God, we again thank you for the tremendous love that you've shown upon us while we were still sinners, that Jesus Christ died for us. Thank you that we could respond to what he has done and that we could make Jesus our own and that we could become your children. Thank you for the opportunity to be your hands and feet, to love people, not just everybody, and even the easy part, as I said, around the world, far away, but those who are nearby. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If I could just have your attention for a minute. Uh, that time of year when it's Pastor Appreciation Month. And uh, how appropriate that Pastor would be speaking on love this morning because he has demonstrated his love to us in so many ways. He and Jeannie, Jeannie if you stand as well. <laughs> uh, they have demonstrated their love. Uh, it Pastor served for a short time in Nebraska, and after that he came here in 1985 and began this church. He's been serving here ever since, and he has demonstrated his love to us in all the ways that he has served us spiritually with the preaching, uh, the ministry that he's done, with the teaching and all the teaching, the Bible studies and everything else, and all the special occasions, which in Jean, with her music ministry, has demonstrated their love to us uh, in their faithfulness to the Lord and their faithfulness in serving this church. And as a result, uh, and I just want to read this one verse to you. I came across it this week as I was reading 1 Thessalonians. It says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And I thought, what an appropriate verse for today to share with our pastor as he has served us so faithfully for so many years and so here's a card and a gift for the both of you. Thank you very much for your service. Thank you.